Eagerly awaiting one of the most electrifying announcements of the year, Japanese school children stood huddled outside of Makuhare Meisei, a convention center located in Chiba, Japan. Inside Makuhari Meisei, Nintendo's 7th annual Shoshinkai was underway. A trade show where Nintendo regularly showed off their latest products and in-development titles, this year wasn't much different from other Shoshinkais of the past. However, Nintendo fans and Nintendo executives eagerly awaited one of the most highly anticipated announcements, the 64-bit, 3D-capable Nintendo 64. The year was 1990, and Nintendo was preparing to release the Super Nintendo Entertainment System in Japan. A year later, it hit the North American market. A very capable 16-bit machine rivaling the Sega Genesis, it really was an all-out war between the two. Only a few years later, in 1994, 16-bit was starting to become a thing of the past. With the release of the Atari Jaguar and the 3DO in 93, and the Saturn and newcomer PlayStation in 94, Nintendo knew that they had to release something as to not lose market share. They did have something up their sleeve, but they were just a little late to the party. In 1993, a company by the name of Silicon Graphics Inc. created a design proposal for a new video game system. Wanting to branch out their business, they based a new chip design off of their MIPS R4000 family of workstation CPUs. This CPU required less resources to run it, consuming only 0.5 watts versus their average 1.5 to 2.0 watts. The CPU also had an estimated production cost of $40, compared to their other CPU production costs of up to $200. This design proposal landed on the desk of Tom Kalinske, CEO of Sega of America, who, after some negotiations, was quite impressed with SGI's newest CPU and ended up inviting their company to meet with Sega's hardware team. However, Sega's professionals ended up claiming the early prototype had many unresolved hardware issues and deficiencies. With that in mind, Sega ended up passing on the prototype. SGI CEO Jim Clark later met with Hiroshi Yamauchi, CEO of Nintendo, to discuss the same proposal and soon began development of Project Reality, with Nintendo backing the project instead of Sega. Project Reality was formally announced on August 23, 1993, at Nintendo's annual Shoshinkai. The full announcement included the joint development and licensing agreements, including that the project would be developed specifically for Nintendo, will be unveiled in arcades in 1994, and will be available for home use in 1995, below $250. The core set of components included the MIPS R4300i CPU, the MIPS Reality coprocessor, embedded software, and some chip technology and manufacturing provided by NEC, Toshiba, and Sharp. After acquiring MIPS Computer Systems or MIPS Technologies, SGI and MIPS worked closely to design the Reality Immersion Technology chips. These were directed by Jim Foran and hardware architect Tim Van Hook. Initially, the Project Reality development platform was developed and sold by SGI in the form of the Onyx supercomputer, costing roughly $100,000 to $250,000. This supercomputing platform would serve as the source design which would be reduced down and eventually became the Reality Immersion Technology for Project Reality. Later, on June 23, 1994, Nintendo announced the new name for Project Reality the Ultra 64. Nintendo also announced the Dream Team, which was a group of elite developers working on games for the Ultra 64, including Rare, Acclaim Entertainment, DMA Design, Angel Studios, Ocean, Time Warner Interactive, Software Creations, and more. Thanks to purchasing and further developing Project Reality's graphics platform, Nintendo and this Dream Team could prototype their games based on the estimated console performance prior to any finalization of the hardware. Eventually, the Ultra 64's hardware was indeed finalized. The finalized specifications included a 64-bit NEC VR4300, which was a licensed variant of the MIPS R4300 that had 24 kilobytes of cache and ran at 93.75 megahertz. 
it was able to reach a performance maximum of 125 million instructions per second, or MIPS, and 93.75 million floating point operations per second, or MFLOPS. The GPU was a 64-bit reality coprocessor that ran at 62.5 MHz, and could run over half a billion arithmetic operations per second and dual issuing scalar and vector operations. This GPU is a microcode reprogrammable GPU that was composed of two integrated processors, the Reality Signal Processor and the Reality Display Processor. Microcode is used in processor design and is a layer of hardware level instructions that implement higher level machine code. So instead of coding in the raw machine code or the lower level design code, if one wanted, they could program in the microcode to implement new effects or tweak the processor entirely to achieve a new output. For example, microprogramming or tweaking the microcode was used to include high resolution graphics, particle engines, unlimited draw distance, and full motion video playback in Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine, Star Wars Rogue Squadron, Star Wars Battle for Naboo, and Resident Evil 2. Having the Reality Coprocessor, or RCP, with the RDP and RSP allowed for offloading tasks to those processors instead of possibly bogging down the CPU with math instructions to create 3D polygonal graphics. Between the RDP and the RSP is a 128-bit data bus that provides 1 gigabyte per second of bandwidth. The RSP itself is a MIPS R4000-based vector processor. The processor itself is only able to address its 4 kilobytes of instruction storage and 4 kilobytes of local data storage. This chip specifically is programmable through microcode, allowing alterations to the vector processing, helping provide different types of work, precision, and workloads. Some of these microcodes were provided by Nintendo themselves. Since the processor is a vector processor explicitly, the RSP is responsible for transform, clipping, lighting calculations, and triangle setup. The RDP, on the other hand, is a fixed pipeline rasterizer and pixel drawing engine, responsible for in-order rasterization and drawing or texturing of pixels in the frame buffer. The RDP has a separate memory front end, both directly accessing memory and moving data to and from the local storage texture cache. System RAM is connected directly to the RCP through a 562.5 megabits per second bus. The CPU itself accesses the RAM through the RCP's memory map using the address data bus. Instead of having an audio chip, the RSP itself normally performs audio functions, though the CPU can also be tasked with this as well. Theoretically capable of 100 channels of PCM at a time, the RSP also has a max sampling rate of 48 kHz with 16-bit audio. It should also be noted that the finalized specs include 4 MB of RD RAM, which is a unified memory architecture meant to have a shared bank between the video, audio, and CPU instead of separate RAM banks. Other specifications include resolutions of 240p, 288p, 480i, 576i, widescreen support through letterboxing or anamorphic compression, a color palette of 16,777,216 colors with 2,097,152 possible colors on screen. Comparing these finalized specs to the Sega Saturn and the PlayStation, the Ultra 64 was capable of 190 mops, with the Saturn at 110 mops and the PlayStation at 66 mops. The geometry processor in the Ultra 64 was capable of 1.4 million polygons per second with flat lighting, and 1 million polygons per second with GORAD lighting, which is a shading technique including an interpolation method by estimating vertexes and the surface normal. The Saturn and PlayStation's geometry processors max out at 800,000 polygons per second and 600,000 polygons per second in flat lighting and 700,000 polygons per second and 360,000 polygons per second with GORAD lighting. Comparing GPUs in flat shading, the Ultra 64 was capable of around 900,000 polygons per second at 32 pixels and 600,000 polygons per second at 64 pixel. The Saturn and the PlayStation were capable of 800,000, 600,000, 500,000, and 360,000 respectively. If you include GORAD shading in that, the Ultra 64 is capable of 600,000 polygons per second, outpacing the Saturn and the PlayStation significantly, which both stand at 200,000 polygons per second. With these specifications finished, a much cheaper, more accurate console board hosted within an SGI Indie workstation 
was available in July of 1995. The SGI estimate and the final Ultra 64 product specifications were so accurate that LucasArts were able to port their Star Wars prototype to the console reference in only three days. In the second financial quarter of 1994, the design of the console was revealed through images, showing off the Nintendo Ultra 64 logo and the ROM cartridge. No controller was initially displayed though, and rumors had circulated that Nintendo would follow Sega's and Sony's lead by using the CD-ROM format, but Nintendo proved everyone wrong by showing off a much faster, space-limited cartridge format. Nintendo would begin marketing the system as the world's first 64-bit gaming system, and would often state that the Ultra 64 was more powerful than the first moon landing computers. While Atari had already made the claim that the Jaguar was more powerful, that system uses a 64-bit architecture with two 32-bit RISC processors. According to a commenter from Electronic Gaming Monthly, if Sega did the math for the Sega Saturn the way Atari did the math for their 64-bit Jaguar system, the Saturn would be a 112-bit monster of a machine. Later on, Nintendo decided to change the name of the system to the Ultra Famicom in Japan and keep the Nintendo Ultra 64 in other markets. Due to possible trademark issues with Konami holding the Ultra Games trademark and wanting to establish a worldwide brand and logo, Nintendo changed the name to the Nintendo 64. This new global name was originally proposed by Shigesato Itoi, creator of the Earthbound series. Back at Makuhare Mese, another group of school kids met up with their friends who had been waiting outside for hours now. Nintendo finally unveiled the new Nintendo 64, to the joy of those kids in a fully playable state. Showing off the final design, which was the same as the one revealed in 1994, Nintendo also showed off the controller, an odd three-pronged design with a fully analog joystick. Shigeru Miyamoto even showed off three different ways of holding the controller in an attempt to explain it. The main star of the show was Super Mario 64, which at the time was a working title. Featuring a fully realized 3D world for the player to explore, the game made main use of the joystick to move around. They also showed off Super Mario R, which would later become Mario Kart 64, Wave Race 64, Legend of Zelda 64, which would become Ocarina of Time, Star Fox 64, Pilot Wing 64, and more. While the console was originally slated to release during the holiday season of 1995, the launch was pushed back to April 1996 and then further delayed to June 23, 1996. The reason for the delay was that the Nintendo 64 software needed to mature, and they wanted to give third-party developers more time to produce games. Adrian Sfarty, a former engineer over at SGI, claims the delay was due to hardware problems, and that the chips underperformed during testing and needed to be redesigned. Early in 1996, the software development kit for the Nintendo 64 was completely redesigned by Kyoto Microcomputer Co. Ltd. as a Windows-based Partner N64 system. The last delay to June was stated to be due to the fact that Nintendo's marketing studies indicated they would not be able to manufacture enough units to meet demand by April. When I polled some people to see if they liked Nintendo's Nintendo 64 or Sega's Saturn, the results were stunning. Every one of the 21 people favored the Nintendo 64. I can't believe that people would prefer a system that isn't out yet over a system that is. I sure hope the Nintendo 64 lives up to its popularity. Daniel Pauly, GamePro, Issue 79 The original launch price was set at 250,000 yen, or roughly $250. And on June 23, 1996, the Nintendo 64 launched in Japan. The Nintendo 64's initial shipment of 300,000 sold out on the first day. With 200,000 units remaining, these consoles shipped on June 26 and the 30th, with almost all of them being reserved prior to launch. In between June 23rd and September 29th, the Nintendo 64 became a hotspot in the gray market. Import stores were able to charge $6.99 plus shipping to get your hands on the system. While the 250,000 yen price would be kept for the Japanese launch in June, 
Nintendo would launch the Nintendo 64 on September 29, 1996 in North America at a launch price of $199.95, mainly to compete with the Saturn and the PlayStation. Nintendo also ran ads with slogans like, wait for it, and is it worth the wait, only if you want the best, to attempt to dissuade consumers from purchasing the competition. When launch day finally came for Nintendo, retailers broke the street date, and the Nintendo 64 was first sold on September 26, 1996. Other than that, the console launched with only two games, Super Mario 64 and Pilot Wings. With that in mind, it still managed to move all 300,000 units by the end of the day. The Nintendo 64 weighs about 2.4 pounds and is a little smaller than the PlayStation, but much smaller than the Sega Saturn. The one I have here is the charcoal gray variant, but there are many other colors of consoles and controllers, including the fantastic colors, jungle green, ice blue, grape purple, fire orange, smoke or clear gray, watermelon red, and more, including a Pikachu version and a golden version. The AC adapter isn't a huge brick, but the power supply itself is what is plugged into the console, possibly to save on space. Along with the power connector, the back has the same RCA video connector as the Super Nintendo, though Nintendo did release an S-video cable to allow for better picture quality. On the front, you have four controller ports for split-screen play. According to Miyamoto, the Nintendo 64 was the first console powerful enough to enable four-player split-screen easily, which is why there are four ports. Of course, you have the usual power on button and the reset button and a little door that says memory expansion. Yes, the Nintendo 64 had a slot in place specifically for memory expansion. Launching in a bundle with Donkey Kong 64, the expansion pack gave the Nintendo 64 an extra 4 megabytes of RAM to use. The reason for its inclusion with DK64 is rumored to be due to a game-breaking memory leakage. According to lead artist on the game, Mark Stevenson, that decision to use the expansion pack was made early on in development, and Nintendo bundled the item with the game as to avoid confusion. Quite a few games benefit from the memory pack, but few require it. The main enhancements involve bigger textures, higher resolutions, and for Majora's Mask, less fog use than Ocarina of Time. Now onto the controller. This alien-looking design did have a purpose, as was explained by Miyamoto before the system launched. With 10 total buttons, the main attraction to the Nintendo 64's controller was of course the analog stick, enabling easier movement in a 3D space. It also featured a port on the back to plug different accessories into. For example, Star Fox 64 would release with the Rumble Pack that would give the controller rumble functionality. Pokemon Stadium would release with the Transfer Pack which would allow players to transfer their Pokemon from red, blue, or yellow into the game to battle in these 3D environments. And of course, the Controller Pack, which was the system's memory card. Though most games had save functionality built into the Game Pack cartridge itself, some use the controller pack as extra saving, like in Mario Kart 64 where you could save your times on it. Nintendo's 1996 Shoshinkai would be held only a month later, on November 22nd through November 24th. Following the launch of the Nintendo 64, Nintendo announced and showed off games such as Mario Kart 64, Star Fox 64, Turok, Yoshi's Story, and a concept for Zelda 64. It should be noted that Yoshi's Story and Zelda 64 were not in a playable state. Earthbound 64 would also be shown off in a short trailer for the very first time. The biggest showing at this expo following the launch of the Nintendo 64 was in fact the 64DD. The DD stands for Disk Drive or Dynamic Drive, and was an add-on for the Nintendo 64. Reports surrounding this debut are conflicting, with IGN stating the 64DD was one of the biggest items there, other press reports stated the 64DD was kept out of the spotlight altogether. The 64DD was set to release late 1997 in Japan. It was shown as a part of its own booth with finalized specs, a copy of Super Mario 64 playing on it, and demonstrations of rendering audience members' faces onto 3D avatars, a feature that would later be put into Mario Artist Talent Studio for the 64DD. After showing off new games and the 64DD, Holiday 96 would come and pass, and by the end of it, the Nintendo 64 would go on to sell 1.5 million units. Once 1997 started, Europe and Australia were able to get their hands on the Nintendo 64 on March 1st, 1997. With that, in early 1997, Nintendo managed to outsell Sony and Sega, and by the end of its first full year, the Nintendo 64 managed to sell 3.6 million units.
While the Nintendo 64 seemed to be doing well, selling 1.5 million units by the end of 96 and 3.5 million units by the end of its first full year, that doesn't mean it wasn't without faults. The holiday of 1997 was weaker than Nintendo had anticipated due to game delays. Ocarina of Time, Banjo-Kazooie, Conker's Quest, which would become Conker's Bad Fur Day, Yoshi's Island, and Major League Baseball featuring Ken Griffey Jr. were all delayed from holiday 97 to 1998. Many journalists, historians, and fans of Nintendo were very confused as to why Nintendo decided to go with a cartridge-based format instead of the CD-ROM format that was taking over. Nintendo's primary defense was that the ROM-based cartridges were blazing fast in terms of load times. The read-write speed of Nintendo's cartridges could hit 50 megabytes per second. Along with the fast peak read and write speed, the latency was also nearly instantaneous. Compare that to the CD-ROM, which had a 300 kilobits per second peak in read-write and an average latency of 200 plus milliseconds. Nintendo also loved keeping things in control, and what better way to control piracy and licensing than forcing a proprietary cartridge? With these advantages that Nintendo stated, there came quite a few pitfalls to the cartridge-based format. One of the worst downfalls to Nintendo's game packs were the production times. Each production run would normally take two weeks or more from order to delivery. In theory, that means that publishers had to guesstimate how much the game would sell, or else they would have either too many games on shelves or not enough to meet demand quickly. Of course, CDs were also incredibly easy and cheap to produce, whereas the game packs were quite expensive, thus making games more expensive. In today's date, we've seen gamers complain about the Switch tax, which is where games release on the Switch at a higher price, and part of it could be pointed at Nintendo's Switch cartridges. In comparison, the Nintendo 64 games averaged $10 more expensive compared to games on PlayStation or even the Saturn. The biggest issue with Nintendo's cartridges is the maximum data these cartridges could hold. The Nintendo 64 game packs had a maximum of 64 megabytes, and those only came around near the end of the Nintendo 64's lifespan. CDs, on the other hand, held a maximum of 650 megabytes. That's more than 10 times the amount of storage, and for elaborate, incredibly long games, that mattered. Final Fantasy VII was originally planned for the superior hardware of the Nintendo 64, but due to these cartridge limitations, development was shifted to the PlayStation. The Super Nintendo was known for its incredible JRPG library, yet due to Nintendo's decision to keep with their cartridge-based format, hit JRPGs like Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, and even the Chrono Trigger sequel released on the PlayStation instead of the Nintendo 64. Not to mention how, according to The Economist, horrendously complex the system is to program for. According to Genyo Takeda, the hardware development chief, when we made the Nintendo 64, we thought it was logical that if you want to make advanced games, it becomes technically more difficult. We were wrong. We now understand it's the cruising speed that matters, not the momentary flash peak power. It appears the idea to make the RSP reprogrammable was to push the limits of the N64 and allow for better performance. Although there are great technical examples of this, there's a reason why the Nintendo 64's library is most well known for its first party titles like Mario 64, Ocarina of Time, Smash, and more, and its second party hits like GoldenEye 007, the Banjo-Kazooie games, Star Wars games, and more. Nintendo decided to attempt to combat the lack of storage with the 64DD. While it was first announced in 1995, Nintendo stated it would launch in 1996, but its first public appearance was at the 1996 Shoshinkai. The 64DD used a proprietary magnetic disk drive similar to the Famicom disk system, and would enhance the 64's audio and technical capabilities. The 64DD itself had three main design features, which were its use of dual storage, that being cartridges and floppy disks, its real-time clock, and its internet connectivity. The proprietary magnetic disk was capable of holding 64 megabytes of data and having a read-write speed of up to 1 megabits per second with only 75 milliseconds of latency. The 64 megabytes of storage was a big deal, as with the game pack, the theoretical maximum was 64 megabits, but only four games ever released with that much data. Along with the increased storage, the real-time clock was also a big deal to many developers. 
Shigesato Itoi, at the time of the N64's release, was developing Earthbound 64 and apparently had many ideas thanks to the real-time clock functionality. The flagship title for the 64DD was originally supposed to be Ocarina of Time. Due to performance requirements, however, the game was shifted over to a regular game pack. This, combined with the numerous delays the 64DD was hit with, it seemed as though nothing would ever go well for the 64DD. The add-on was slated to release in 1996 along with the Nintendo 64, but was pushed back to release in late 1997. On May 30th, 1997, however, Nintendo announced that they would be delaying the release of the 64DD to March 1998, and with that announcement came no word on a North American release. At E3 1997, there was still nothing to show, with Howard Lincoln stating that they would not release the device until there was software to support it. Rumors had spread that Donkey Kong 64, a sequel to Super Mario 64, and around 20 other titles were in development for the 64DD. Americans were given a launch window of early 1998, and Miyamoto stated the first games for the add-on would be SimCity 64, Mario Artist, a Pocket Monsters game, and Mother 3. Later, Miyamoto would detail the difficulty of speaking about the 64DD in an interview with Shigesato Itoi, saying, it would have been easier to understand if the DD was already included when the N64 first came out. It's getting harder to explain after the fact. Shigesato E. Toy would go on to say, I came up with a lot of ideas because of the 64 DD. All things start with the 64 DD. There are so many ideas I wouldn't have been allowed to come up with if we didn't have the 64 DD. Miyamoto would add, almost every new project for the N64 is based on the 64DD. We'll make the game on cartridge first, then add the technology we've cultivated to finish it up as a full-out 64DD game. Speculations continued and IGN expected all major N64 games to have support for the 64DD, with known third-party developers being Konami, Titus, Rare, Ocean, Factor 5, and more. Unfortunately, the 64DD was further delayed to June 1998 in Japan and then to April 3, 1998, with the American launch being delayed to late 1998. With these announcements, the 64DD was completely absent from E3 1998, with rumors floating that would not launch in 98 and could possibly launch in 1999, leading Next Generation Magazine to state it was as close to dead as we can imagine. Later, on April 8, 1999, it was announced by IGN to be released in June of 99, along with Mario Artist. It was demonstrated later at E3 1999, but there were no longer any plans to release it outside of Japan. The 64DD would eventually be released in Japan only on December 13, 1999, and would only have a total of 10 games released. While there was a lot of anticipation for the system, the further delays, a seeming lack of confidence in the system, along with a lack of games, eventually killed the 64DD and Nintendo's possible expansion software. That's a video for another day, though. By the end of the Nintendo 64 lifespan, which was 2002, the Nintendo 64 managed to sell 5.54 million units in Japan. 20.63 million units in the Americas, and 6.75 million units elsewhere, with a total of 32.93 million units sold. Thanks to Nintendo's weird decision to stick with cartridges, turning off the hugely popular RPG genre that was gaining traction in Japan and North America, along with the odd 64DD promises Nintendo made, the Nintendo 64 trailed behind the majorly successful PlayStation. It did manage to outsell the Sega Saturn in total units. However, it's still speculated that it wasn't quite as popular in Japan thanks to the lack of RPGs on the system. With that being said, the Nintendo 64 is still recognized as one of the most influential consoles in gaming. With releases such as Super Mario 64, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Banjo-Kazooie, GoldenEye 007, Mario Kart 64, Super Smash Bros., Star Fox 64, and more, all of these are widely recognized as some of the best games of not only the generation, but in all of video game history.
Hey everyone, this is Video Game Docs. Welcome all new subscribers. Since the launch of my Pokemon Snap video, I've more than doubled in subs, so welcome aboard. I hope you enjoyed the history of the Nintendo 64, and with this, we've officially finished the big three consoles of the fifth generation. What's your favorite fifth generation console? I'd have to say I'm between the N64 and the Saturn, honestly. Anyways, if you have any suggestions for future videos, let me know in the comments. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.